All right. Um, so looks like we have some newcomers today, 92. So hopefully we get some more repeats. Um, again, I'm Julianne. I'm in Weehawken, New Jersey. I'm literally right down the street from the dual site. So that's exciting. Um, and uh, I just wanted to say like, thank you for being here. I will just tell you quickly. Um, Tuesday was actually really awesome and I didn't realize how awesome it was um, until I came down <laughs> and because I haven't gotten to talk shop or like see anybody in a month and it was just, I just want to tell you that this time is precious um, and I really found that out yesterday because I crashed hard um, and these are things that I'm really looking forward to. I really miss seeing you all and talking shop so I just want to thank Georgia and Maestra for these opportunities to have a collective of intelligence and to be able to talk shop and to talk to people from around the world about things that we're passionate about. Um, it's what is getting me through right now. So just like this time is really precious and I just thank you very much. Um, all right, so for those of you who were on Tuesday, I gave you a homework assignment. I'm interested to see how we did. For those of you who were not here on Tuesday, uh, I included the homework assignment in your Dropbox. So the homework was um, this cathedral, um, cathedral sunset slash transformation. I'm gonna start sharing my screen and uh, we'll get started here. Boop, 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 boop. And I have to hide you all or else I get nervous. <laughs> so, um, so Cathedral Sunset Transformation, this is number 20C in um, the Keyboard One book of Shrek. Uh, again, Shrek is written by Janine Tesori, who is a Maestra member, a Tony Award winning composer. So I felt like this was appropriate material for Maestra. Uh, so this is what a keyboard book looks like. I want you to just take a look at the engraving here and see, um, first of all, how to analyze, like as a programmer, whether you are a professional programmer, whether you're an MD, um, you know, on a community theater level, whatever, you're MDing for a high school, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, a couple things to look at here. First of all, measure one, downbeat of measure one, the top right hand, um, has clear vibes, okay? So we have this bum, bum, bum. I don't have perfect pitch. Bum, 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 bum. Okay, what's going on in the show, just so you know, is Fiona, uh, the curse is about to happen and she's going to be turned into an ogre forever, okay? Um, so, and they're going into the wedding, etc. Um, so right hand, clear vibes. What does clear vibes mean? This is where you have to start becoming like a programmer slash sound designer slash orchestrator slash single part of your, the single entity of your music team, et cetera, et cetera. I take clear vibes to mean I can hear them clearly. <laughs> you know, I want something that's going to attack through the mix, that's going to cut through. As, so as a part of, as opposed to like a warmer sound that we talked about on Tuesday, I want to really focus it and get it to cut through. Um, okay, so that's in the right hand. Now check this out. Down here on the left hand, we have piano. So what that, what this is already calling for is a keyboard split as I'm planning things out in advance. So you have a keyboard split, right hand, left hand. Now, where is the split note? Okay, so the highest, again, my middle C that I program with is a C3. If you have a C4, then program that way, but I'm using a C3. So uh, looks like my highest note is this F3 right here, okay? It doesn't look like I'm going any higher. So when I come into program, I'm gonna take my piano patch and layer it up to the F. Okay, um, just so these are things that I'm starting to think about. Um, my, I'm just gonna use the standard vibraphone patch. So you'll see over here on the basic template I gave you, you've got a Steinway Grand Piano and you've got your vibraphone patch already set to go. So then once you plan that out, you can come up here into this untitled patch and um, you can come, uh, always go back to your master instrument list, select your channel strip, Command C. I'm gonna come up here 
just in the gray area, I'm going to go Option Command V. Okay, so now I have an aliased piano strip that always goes back to the master host instrument. So that if you down the road buy a nice piano patch, you just load that piano patch in and all of your programming reflects that change. Yeah. Okay, so now I'm going to take this vibraphone. I'm going to click on here, Command C. I'm going to come up here and I'm going to Option Command V. So now I've got layers, but I want to do a split. So I'm going to come in here to Layer Editor, right? And I know that I want my top note of my grand piano patch to be that F3. So I'm going to go my highest key, learn, play that F3. Okay, so now I want the lowest. It's fine for right now. I'm just going to have the lowest um, patch or the lowest key on my vibraphone be an F sharp three, just for now. So low key, F sharp three. Now you just have a simple split, split keyboard. So now I can start to get through this. Close it. All right, key viola. I'll play it in a second. So you understand how that splits. Now, what is this curse synth? Okay, so curse synth, quotation marks, we are representing this like ethereal, magical, slightly scary moment. The more uh, words that you can mentally use to describe what's going on on stage will affect what you put together um, in your programming. Uh, and that is kind of the, the orchestration, music director part of you, sound designer part of you that goes into programming. I, you know, you can listen to the original cast recording, listen to what they have. I gave you some pads to play with. Um, so in, I know some of you probably made that a separate patch, but in actuality, uh, the highest note on the vibraphone is a C5. Yeah. The highest note on the vibraphone is uh, a C5, and if you look at how the curse synth is, it's, it's, trans it's played up two octaves, right? So, so the lowest note on the curse patch is that B5. Yeah, I'm just making sure my numbers are correct. So does everybody see that? The lowest note on that curse patch is a C5, or a B5. So, and then you play everything up there. So that way, now you're starting to spread out on your keyboard. So you don't actually have to do a patch change until guess what, measure 33 when we're just to clear vibes. And you can't actually keep the piano patch on at measure 33 because our highest piano note was that F3 and we dipped down into the piano land. So you have to make a new patch. So instead of building all of this right now, I'm just gonna show it to you of what I did. Uh, so I save patches and things like that to pull in. So this will also kind of show you some of my programming that we're getting into. So uh, over here on my screen on the left is my main stage. This is all on your basic template. I just didn't give you the, some of these parts. Uh, so set list, I've got number 20C. Just so you know, in my Shrek programming, this vibe patch change. Oh my gosh, there's a really big bug. Oh. oh, it's one of those silverfish things. Oh, glad that happened. Okay. So uh, my patch change is 64 and I label it vibes piano curse. So check this out. Okay, hopefully you can see here. Um, so I have my Steinway Grand Piano, I have my keyboard split, and then I gave you some pads, but this is also was kind of part of the homework is to play around with some of the different sounds that you have going on for your curse pads. So this is what I've got going on. Pretty cool. So all I did to find these pads is I came into my channel strip library 
Um, and, and again, some people might have different channel stripped libraries. I think these, this is a logic library that I had, but the whole point is I came to synthesizers, I came to a synth pad, and then uh, this one is called a mighty warm pad, and I layered it in underneath with slow glow, which is another pad. I just did a lot of sound auditioning. Um, if anybody's like a synthesizer pro and knows like oscillating and changing the envelopes and like changing from let's say like a square lead to a, or a square wave to a sine wave, et cetera, have at it. Uh, there's some super powerful um, synthesized processors that are built into Mainstage and they're all part of logic processing. Um, so you can come into this, which is the ES, uh, I believe this is the ES2, and I look at this and my brain scrambles a little bit, but you can play around with things. Here's the envelope, the attack, delay, sustain. Uh, you could change your EQ, you could change like with distortion, et cetera, until you find a sound that you like. Um, and then, I did not transpose these. So let me just show you now how this whole queue should lay out. So you really have just two patch changes. You'll see here, measure 33, um, that's where my patch number 65 comes in, okay? Um, use the floating down two notes in clear vibes. Oh, cool. There's definitely ways to do that. Uh, oh yeah, that bug was gross, okay. Uh, let me just play for you what I did. Turn on my volume for you. So that's a way to do it, um, at least for me. Uh, hopefully, obviously, like Hosun, I see that you use a different way. There's different ways to program. That's the way that I did it. Um, there's also something that I really like about Mainstage is that even if you are holding a note, for example, let me go back. If you are holding a note, let's see, this synthesizes a pad, so it's going to hold this note. And I change the patch. The sound only changes once I reattack. So I really love that is I can hold a note, switch the patch, it's still going to sustain, but next time I attack, new patch. All right. So that is uh, programming for Cathedral Sunset. I would mark it um, with a patch change at the top with a number one, uh, mark it as measure one. And here you'll see, and we'll get into this programming stuff in a second, but you will see that um, in this template that I gave you, I put in my measure numbers down here on the bottom left, and I title it with the patch change number for my programming so that I can quickly look over and be like, oh, 64, 64. Cool. Um, and then the curse synth is up there. I also use the expression pedal to help with the modulate or to with the volume. So I'm going to bring it down to a subido piano and then build it up to the um, fortissimo. Also, my Yamaha Clavinova here does not have a pitch wheel, but my Yamaha CP40 rig um, keyboard has a pitch wheel. So then you can do that like boop, really slide into it. Again, play more orchestrally. Okay, I'm going to move on. I hope everybody uh, enjoyed that experience. Let's take a look here at this PDF that I've put together. Okay, so um, hopefully you can all see this. Okay, 
I'm going to stretch this out a little bit more. Main stage 102, basic keyboard programming for the pit. So right now I am talking about keyboard programming for the musical theater pit. Before you touch a computer, <laughs> here we go. Um, let me bring up this chat for a second. Before you touch a computer, uh, you need to plan everything out. Uh, it is, programming is simply just solving a puzzle. So hopefully if you like puzzles, programming is for you. Uh, also, no two shows, scenarios, or design collaborators are the same. You could do the same show in a different theater with a different design team, and it's going to be a different show. You're going to end up routing things differently. You're going to like change around the settings of your audio rig, et cetera. So before you even get into programming, you have to map and organize everything out ahead of time, or you are going to waste your time. You're going to make a dumb mistake or something that doesn't work at the beginning, and then you're going to spend hours trying to figure out what's wrong, trying to fix it, etc. So here's my suggestions. Also, I hope that you enjoy the piano arc. That is a dream rig someday. Just put me in, like, I'm in, I'm in my pit blacks, just put me in. <laughs> um, but it gives me like, it's beautiful. So a couple things before you touch this computer. So you've got a show, you're going to assess your music, right? Create an instrument list on paper, organize your thoughts like, Okay, so for Shrek, like I, for that, you know, I, the instrument list is huge for Shrek. Um, I'm going to need like a good accordion patch for Farquaad stuff. I'm going to need to do like all of these um, marcato brass type things. Um, I'm going to have to learn how to uh, map harp uh, arpeggios and glisses. Um, I have these sound cues, which we're going to talk about, of the burps and farts in the swamp. Um, I have like some really nice piano pads. I have all of this harp. I have harpsichord, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to map it out. I'm going to think about what sounds I need. If I need to buy any specific instruments, do it in advance. Do your research. Um, now, are there any sound cues in the music? Shrek, yes, there's the burps and farts on top of some other stuff, but those are specific ones I want to talk about. Um, do sound cues come from the pit? Are they musically motivated? Do they need to happen on a specific beat? Or do they need to come from the sound booth? Are they visually um, motivated? So, but, but it's still a sound cue that's in your book. So like, what's going on? Um, are you going to be using a click track? That's a major discussion to like plan in advance. Like, how are you going to put the click track in? How, who's running it? Are you putting it in your music? Are these cues that you need to program? Et cetera. Are you going to be using any sweeteners? Are we doing any backing tracks? Like I did Matilda um, at a regional theater and they, the kids, like we had to record all of Revolting Children because those kids cannot move around on stage like that and say those letters that fast. So we have to like click it and put in the sweeteners. So like, is this going into our programming? Is that, are the sweeteners coming from the booth? You have to start mapping everything out. Are you using any analog gear for your sound? So like, uh, I was talking with uh, a, the associate MD on the Jesus Christ Superstar National Tour yesterday, and he's using a, I don't know what it was, but the Ham, a Hammond um, synthesizer board on top, and then a main stage rig. So he's got a stack, right? And so he's running that Hammond board, the analog board, um, into all of his queuing in addition to all of his phantom synthesizers, and he's got seven pedals on the floor. Okay, so you have to plan for analog gear. That's what we talked about, those external patches on Tuesday, that's analog gear. Um, you gotta go through your music, like on Cathedral Sunset, and it's all just puzzle, like, okay, so where are the patch changes? You saw in that music, it's not always clear, you know, is this a patch change or is this just another layer or can I move it up here? Like, where are the actual go buttons for the next patch. Pencil it into your music. Also, do you have all of your appropriate hardware for the pit and rig that you're loading into? Do you need to get a DI box? Do you need to get, um, you know, more cabling? Do you need to get that extra patch advanced pedal? What do you need in advance? So that's just like programming mapping mentally before you even touch this computer. Next step, now that you've gone through all this stuff, you have to communicate 
with your sound department, with your stage management department, and your music department. I'm going to put this, talk to music department if applicable necessary. Uh, having a music department is a luxury. In many, many cases, you are the singular music department. So, but if you have other heads to talk to within your music department, use them, like map it out, make sure everybody's on the same page. All right, your sound designer and your stage manager are your two best friends in these scenarios. Um, have a conversation with your sound designer about what they need from your rig. Even if you're in like a high school pit scenario, you're in a community theater scenario, you're in a wedding band scenario, like whatever sound tech is receiving your audio signal, you must have a very clear and concise conversation with them. You need to know what they need. Um, how are you going to output your audio and how are you going to route it? Are we just sending a stereo one, two? Are we sending uh, stereo one, two and re like, like dry stereo on one and two, wet reverb on three and four, sound cues on five, click on six. You see what I'm saying? Like there's, you can really start to plan all of that out. Um, discuss the clicks and sweeteners routing. For some in instances in the pit, I'm going to send my click out directly into the pit. It's never going to go up to the sound booth. In other scenarios, probably more like professional scenarios, you're going to send the click all the way up to the sound booth and then they're going to send it back to you. Same thing with the sweeteners. Maybe they want to process the sweeteners. Like every scenario is different. Uh, <laughs> did you hire a bass player? <laughs> I say this in jest, but in all honesty, like um, because we have to talk about budgets and there have been scenarios where I'm really sorry, but the, the bass player got cut. And so I all of a sudden have to play the bass. I know not ideal at all, but I had to start to play the bass um, because no bass player. And so therefore I would send all of my keyboard uh, type patching through outputs one and two. And then I would send just the bass patch through channel three, for example, up to the board so that they have complete control over that singular instrument. The more control that a sound designer has over your singular program instruments, the happier they are, the more cohesive it sounds. Um, great. Have a conversation with your stage manager. Once you've had this conversation with um, uh, your sound designer, then you have to talk to your stage manager. Discuss sound cue routing and your potential plan. Like, hey, this cue is going to work best because it's musically um, engaged. It has to be on a specific beat. It's going to come here. I'm going to put it on the go button or this click is going to fire and it's going to come back and it's going to then send mini signal and it's going to fire video projections and light and our, or I'm just sending timestamp, etc. So you really have to plan with your stage manager. Um, great. Now, what if you're playing with a piano vocal with a reduced pit? You're like, I'm not even have a keyboard book to play, but I have a reduced pit and I want to make it sound more full. Okay, a um, couple things to look at here. Plan out your pit in regards to your budget and your needs. You're gonna look at your, um, sometimes like you just have, that's it, that's your pit. You've got your standard five, six instruments maybe you luxuriously have nine. Um, other times you as an MD can be like, okay, so I'm only allowed five players with this budget, but like, I'm gonna hire a lead trumpet, I'm gonna hire a doubler, I have to have guitar for this one, obviously drums, bass, yeah, okay, I'm gonna do bass. Sometimes it's like either bass or second keys, or sometimes it's either second guitar or second keys. So you gotta really plan out what you need. Um, then this is where the time you become an orchestrator. You're going to have to reorchestrate your instrument books as necessary. Like, um, you know, maybe that flute part is going to go over to the violinist, or maybe that violin part is going to go over to the flute, the flout, the flautist, um, et cetera. Or maybe that oboe part is going to go to the trumpet on um, a straight mute, you know, to give that buzzy sound, et cetera. So you may have to do some reorchestrating reduction type of work um, and, and then look at your own part and see kind of what you might be able to pick up. Or, you know, if you've got room to hire a keyboard too, but there's no key two part, you can make a key two part. Um, it's a lot of work. We've all done it, right? <laughs> Singular music department. Um, so you can hire a key two player and be like, 
you're going to play clarinets two and three uh, while my live reed doubler, doubler is playing the first clarinet line. So we're just here to like support and um, create harmony. Plan out the parts that you yourself can cover in the book. Like, oh, well, you know what? There's this one little glockenspiel line and I can, I'm only playing my left hand so I can throw that glockenspiel line up there. Uh, when you are reducing and orchestrating, um, you want to support and flesh out your live musicians. Uh, do your best not to cover non-keyboard parts. So the keyboard parts are awesome. Vi uh, glockenspiel, vibraphone, obviously piano, um, the, the organs, uh, the whirlies, anything like that. When you start to get into more orchestral type patches, especially on the basic patches, you don't really want to play a solo line. But it does work well if you have a live instrument and then you're playing softly, quieter underneath, either an octave below or in harmony, because then what you're doing is you're just building support for your orchestra. Um, and then in my own music, I highlight instrumental cues like, oh, look at that little um, horn cue. I did not hire a French horn, but I can play that little cue while the trumpet's playing the upper brass line and the woodwind doubler is playing you know, the, the first clarinet or they're on the, on the flute, et cetera. Um, so I just highlight and, or sometimes I'm like, oh, I just got to take this violin line and stick it in here and, and see how it works. Uh, make effective decisions, work smarter, not harder. Like there's not really a rule book. And that's something that I have had to really process a lot is there's not completely a rule book on how to do this. It's just making effective decisions so that your show sounds to the best of, of its ability within budgetary um, restraints and that it performs smoothly and efficiently. Um, so I'm going to show you a quick example of a show I did two years ago, uh, Man of La Mancha. I hope you can see this over here. So Man of La Mancha, no piano part at all. So if I am uh, in this pit and I only am allowed to hire five players, I'm not just gonna sit there and stick conduct the whole time, but there's no piano part. So what am I going to do? Uh, so for this show, I had uh, upright bass, drums, uh, nylon, uh, spent like a nylon guitar, flamenco style guitar. I don't know, I think he had two guitars. Um, I had a lead trumpet player, and then I had a woodwind doubler who played clarinet and flute, and then I had me. Um, so in that scenario, there's no low brass, there's no oboe. Um, sometimes if the clarinetist had to play the flute line, then I would come in and pick up the clarinet, etc. cetera. Um, so I'm just gonna show you quickly what I did. Again, I'm gonna go to a load patch, impossible dream. I feel like this is appropriate for, for right now. I hope everybody's been seeing those videos of Brian Stokes Mitchell singing Impossible Dream out of his uh, window in New York City. Pretty awesome. So over here on the left, I have the Impossible Dream. This is kind of some old programming for me. So um, I've learned some lessons in kind of how I mark things, but I just want to show you what I'm up to. Uh, so first of all, I've got this little Glockenspiel patch. So he's singing and the world will be better than this that one man scorned and covered with scars still strove. okay not bad for a glock patch my drummer has other things going on um so that works now this is so that's kind of what i used at the beginning of this song you'll see here when i come into letter e oh i don't like that that instrument got in the way um, I come in here to letter E and I got rid of the Glock patch and now I'm going to play that on the oboe and I've added some brass. So just check it out. Imagine if you have like a full live trumpet on top and you have other things going on here. So now we have, uh, and the world will be better than this, that one man scored their color. Scores till he struggles with his last ounce of courage to reach the unreachable stars. With a with it with that five piece uh, orchestra, it 
sounds pretty awesome. Okay, so moving forward. Great, so I showed you La Mancha, let's go forward. Uh, 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 uh. Also, if anybody ever wants to put me in this piano arc, just put me in, I'm so ready for it. Great, understanding template programming. I'm going to breeze through this because I really laid it out for you and hopefully it all makes sense. What I've given you is a basic template for you to program in. Okay, this is probably actually not my performance template. I will tell you different strokes, different styles, different programmers, different styles. I personally really like to see um, what's going on in my um, layout. So I like to see the title. So I'm gonna go over here, for example, to vibraphone. I like to see the title in my patch. Other people just put a giant, like if I was 65 on the vibraphone, other people put a giant 65 so that you can look at it quickly. Me, because I'm just a little bit more like need to be in control and anxious. I just want to know that this is a vibraphone, so that what I'm playing is a vibraphone. Um, so that's that. Okay, let's go through this patch display. Um, so this patch display, I'm just going to look here for now. Uh, this is programmed to show your patch list programming. So you've got sets and then you've got your programming inside. Um, as you move through, it highlights whatever current patch you're on. Um, I have programmed your navigation arrows here down at the bottom, and I'm gonna let you click on all this and play with it, maybe later. Um, I've programmed all these arrows down at the bottom. If you hit the down button on the patch, you go on to the next patch. If you hit the up button on the patch, you're going up to the next patch. Same thing for set up and down sets. So that's all programmed. Um, also in your current template, you can play around with it. For those of you who do not have a patch advanced pedal, I have thought of you. Um, I have mapped that bottom, if you're on an 88 key keyboard, that bottom A negative one is programmed to go to the previous patch. And that bottom A sharp negative one is patch advance. So if you do not have a patch list, it's very, very rare that you're going to be playing any sort of instrument channels down there. So you can use that to toggle back and forth instead of having to stomp on that, um, on that patch advance pedal, okay? So that's already in there. You're welcome. Uh, I put in a little banner logo right here because it's pretty. It's totally your call. It's just a design thing. I like to like make it feel good. Um, it's just a JPEG. You can do whatever you want with it. Playback button up here on the top right. This is a start and stop button. So it is not, it is, so you click it, whatever your playback is starts, you click it again, your playback stops. Uh, I use it to play clicks. I use it to play like sweeteners. Sweeteners are like, um, um, sweeteners would be like in Matilda during revolting children. We are revolting children living in revolting times. We had to take them into like the studio record them in advance because when they're doing all of that acrobatics on stage, the vocals just go. <whistles> so um, we record those in advance to a click, we get the click going and then the sweeteners play at the same tempo. So that's like a sweetener. And that can all be programmed within that. Again, commercial shows, if you're on a Broadway level show, off Broadway level show, main stage is a little clunky for that. I would go into Ableton, um, but for basic stuff, this is gonna work. That is a separate class at some point. Um, just so you know, this button is currently mapped to the very top note on your 88 key keyboard, which is that C7. So right now that C7 is mapped to toggle on and off. Um, now, each time you load in a click into a specific patch, you're going to have to title. I get, see where it says click number and name. Um, I gave that little text box for you so that you can title your click, like number eight. And this is, you know, whatever the click is for. What's up, Duloc, et cetera. Um, and then you're going to have to route that playback to, to the playback transport to start and stop your playback. Um, good. Then patch title. Where are you? Oh, yeah, we talked about patch title here. I like to see what the title is. Some people just put a giant number. I like to know what's going on. Volume slider over here on the left, pretty cool thing. Um, it is assigned to your expression pedal. Your expression pedal is um, this thing over here. So, and it's mapped to your volume. Something to know. 
Volume is different than expression. Expression is a percentage of your volume versus the actual volume output. So I like to map everything to the actual volume outputs as opposed to the expression. Um, and you'll see the mini control change numbers I put in there. Volume is number seven, expression is number 11. So what's really cool is as you're working through a show, as you're performing, as you're working through tech, um, over here I have the vibraphone going. Right now you'll see my volume slider. If I hit my expression pedal, look, it goes all the way down to one or zero, total zero. Then I can bring it up. So this is great for like an organ patch. Wait, I have this organ patch down here somewhere. Oh, I used to. Okay, string section, for example. Oh, that's really loud. But let's say I want some control of it. So like in my notes for, for tech, I'm gonna go through and be like, oh, at this point, I put in all these numbers for you. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna take it down to a six. So then as I'm looking, and a lot of times uh, in a, on a rig, you might have like a little volume um, meter box on your piano, on your keyboard, so you're not actually looking at, the, at this, but. Or like, oh, I really want it five, and then right here, I'm gonna grow to eight. And then I'm gonna push it to 10, and then, I, and then for the end of the song, it, sometimes I'll write it to like, to kneel, to nothing, N-I-L, right? Oh, now we're out. So that's what's going on there. So it's a great way to visualize what your volume settings are. Um, modulation pitch wheels are over there on the left. Uh, they're standard modulation pitch wheels. So like in the curse, I wanted to show you that, like the pitch wheel, whoop, you can bend. Uh, modulators can be assigned for tremolo, vibrato, chorusing. I haven't really used them much. Uh, great, then over here is your keyboard. You can layer and split your channel strips like we've been doing. You can assign hot keys and go buttons. I'm gonna show you how to do a go button for a sound cue in a little bit. Uh, down here in the bottom right is your MIDI input button. This is simply like displaying and monitoring whether you have a MIDI signal coming in. So you see my MIDI button, it's turning yellow no matter what I do MIDI wise, okay? It's just, it's great to know, oh good, MIDI's coming through. So even if I'm not getting sound troubleshooting, I know MIDI's coming through, so now I gotta find the sound problem. And then your, your pedals over here, we've talked about them, we assigned them on Tuesday. Your expression pedal, um, it's assigned in layout to either expression or volume, like it just kind of depends on what your MIDI signal is coming in from your keyboard or your audio expression quattro that we talked about, my magic box. Um, but once you get into this, and I've mapped it for you, you want to map your expression ped pedal to control your global volume. Um, and then there's ways that we can take like a sound cue volume and not map it to the volume pedal so that like you could be playing like strings like this, hit that sound cue and that sound cue is just going to play at whatever level you set it at. Uh, your sustain pedal should just be mapped same as input and your patch advanced pedal you're going to map to go to the next patch. But everything's currently mapped this way, it just helps for you to understand it. I'm going to move forward. Uh, programming methodology in edit mode. This is like what you're all waiting for. Um, it's actually pretty, fairly straightforward once you're organized. So I've given you a couple patch lists. Um, this is a patch list from a fun home show that I did recently. It's very simple. There's not a lot of programming. The opening number, it's a piano. The second number, it's a piano with like a small synth looper. Third, you know, piano. Then I go between piano and dirty whirly. But you see what I'm doing is I organize my sets by the song number and the title. And then inside I put the patch and I put the patch change number and what the instrument, like what the main instrument is that I wanna hear and know what's going on. And then you just move down the line, okay? So everything becomes very organized. Um, then this one is Shrek, not as simple as Fun Home. So now you can see, uh, let's see, build a wall. Okay, that's just that like B3 organ that I've kind of messed with. Freak Flag, we're going to go piano, then we're going to go to the organ, the Hammond organ B3, back to piano, back to the organ. And then I'm on a cathedral organ for the wedding procession. And then um, I've got a harp. And then just below this is that cathedral sunrise. So now you can kind of see Again, all of the patches are in sequential order 
and then the songs are all there, and then the measure numbers for exactly where the patches go, go inside your template, okay? So organized sets by song title and number, talked about that. Title patches with patch change number followed by instruments. I like to know what I'm playing. Oh, also, I like to come in here and pick the best icon that is representative of the instrument. So like here, number 51, strings, oboe, and vibes. I decided to pick strings because it is the most prevalent part of the patch that I play. Again, it's just more I like to continue to know where I'm at in my programming and know what's going on. Because once you start to get confused and feel out of control, this programming can eat you. <laughs> Um, so own this, own this rig. Uh, great. Now let's talk about how to actually physically put this into your book. I'm going to give you, I gave you an example here. This is called Welcome to Our House on Maple Avenue. This is uh, big number two in, in Fun Home. So I just took a photo of my score. I use these things. You ready? These are from, uh, you know, CVS, Walmart, etc. My color coding, I use um, pink for click and I use neon green for um, my patches. I don't care much for the orange. Also like growing up, neon pink, neon green and zebra print, that was a good combination. So this gets me very close to my happy place. <laughs> um, so what's going on here, it's kind of unfortunate that it's all twos, but you can see here in the programming, Welcome to our house. Okay, so that's big song number two. You're going to type that into your set title number two. Welcome to our house. Then I'm like, okay, we've got a piano up here on the top and we've got the vi this vintage analog synth arpeggiator here on the bottom. Um, so this is definitely a new patch and in my patch programming that is patch number two. So I put that here on this green button. And also in my click programming, that is big click number two, just happens to how it worked out because I'm gonna use a click in the opening number as well. Uh, also just some things, so that's kind of like, every time you see that green, um, every time you see that green sticker, you just hit that patch advance button. Like as you're playing, you see green, you hit it. You see green, you hit it. Like it gets to that point. You see that pink, coming you're like okay and then I write in notes like click is going to be three four so you're going to get ding 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 okay so just things to be look to also I would take the click after listen to me click click so that the please goes on the three four um I'm sorry I'm not seeing your chat comments for a second I'm just trying to get through but uh, so then I just label my book. I go through my book, write the patch change numbers. Um, everything should correspond. Um, then uh, the template itself we talked about. I'm going back to this. Oh, just so you know, this is the official answer to your homework from Tuesday. And I told you I like to hide Easter eggs. If anybody looked at the packet from the first session, uh, the image overlay underneath my title page is the answer to your homework assignment. <laughs> so um, hopefully, I don't know if anybody picked up on that, but this is the answer. So a couple things. Up here, let's say, I'm not actually gonna run a click for this section, but let's say I did, let's say it's number eight and it's cathedral. I'm gonna label it. Um, I'm gonna come down here and, and type in measure one. Um, I'm going, so now let's just talk about general programming for a second. Um, you're going to copy in your alias instrument channel strips. We've talked about this. We're going to layer, split, transpose, set appropriate volume levels. You know, how do things relate to each other? Oh, wow, that, that vibraphone compared to that piano is really like harsh. So you're gonna have to do some sound design and volume programming by ear. Um, down here in the measure number, if it's specifically the patch change is like one, two, change that patch, three, okay, then you're going to type in, for example, measure m.1.3. So I know that specifically that patch change is on beat three as opposed to the downbeat. Um, we talked about adding the clicker sweetener audio for playback. Again, that is another very deep, deep dive rabbit hole that is another class. Um, 
you're going to always map that audio channel strip to playback transport. I'll show you this. Um, right in the click queue number in the title. Uh, we talked about that. Uh, write the click queue number on your corresponding colored sticker in your music. I don't even know where that thing went. Um, and then notate any specific desired volume levels in your music as necessary, like what I talked about on the strings. And so like, as you're mapping, you're like, ooh, okay, this should be at a seven, this should be at a six, so that you have somewhere to, to go. Um, so that's, I hope you can go back to this, like, look at this. I tried to make it as uh, clean and clear as possible as far as just, and again, this is my style of programming. It seems to be very organized. It seems like then during tech when they're like, hey, can we go to bar 52 of morning person reprise? I'm like, yes, I'm there, done. Okay, uh, <laughs> wait, there's a sound cue? <laughs> what? Cool, so main stage does some awesome sound cueing programming. Um, I gotta look at my notes. Did I skip something? Yes, we did this. Okay, main stage does some awesome sound cue programming. It can load, this is what's called the EXS24 sampler. So I'm gonna come here and delete this uh, patch right now. And I'm just gonna add a new patch, new clean patch. I'm gonna come down here and we're going to add a sound cue. Okay, so to, so EXS24 sampler, another entire class and deep dive rabbit hole. Um, it can sample. So you can take different audio files, specifically .wav, WAV files, you cannot use an MP3, um, load it in to the different keys if you want. And you can create a playable instrument. You could create like your own percussion map. You could uh, record your own thumb piano right and map it into specific notes you could record me uh, blowing on a bottle or you know anything like any sort of sound can be mapped to create an, a playable midi instrument so that's really cool i use it to um play sound cues um so in order to do that what you're going to do is create an, a software instrument channel i'm going to create that over here just stretch this out for a second. And then over here, before you go to your channel strip, you're gonna come down here to input, which is an instrument, okay? And I put all of this over here so hopefully you can visualize it. I'm gonna come down here to the EXS24 sampler. Again, before you, hopefully you have it mapped out. Like, is this a sound cue that needs to go to the board on channel three specifically, which would be considered mono, or, is this like a synthesizer sound that I just want to like map and play it as an instrument inside of my main programming? Because then you're going to map that to outputs one and two. So you have to plan in advance. Uh, this one I'm going to do is actually a sound cue. So, um, but I don't have my stuff mapped right now. So I'm still just going to send it through outputs three and four for right now, or one and two. Great. So now what pulls up is this EXS24 instrument. You're going to come up here to edit, and I'm going to just move through this quickly. Edit. Uh, we're going to go over here to zones. This is now your instrument editor. We're going to go new zone. We're going to click load audio sample. And I gave you these audio samples. I just have to find them myself. So anytime, mate. Why aren't you working? There we go. Uh, anytime I do this type of programming, I always make an SFX folder. So everything stays organized within kind of my larger programming folder. So I gave you my SFX folder for this presentation. I'm going to be programming shop bell two. And you'll see why. Okay, so now, not quite done yet, uh, once you've loaded your audio sample, which is a WAV file, we're going to come over here to playback. There's a couple things about playback that are very essential in understanding. Uh, you have different options. You have pitch, you have one shot, and you have reverse. Pitch means I could play, um, 
Okay, that's a shop bell cue. Or I can play it higher. It's digitally uh, warping all of this. Cool. So I can do that. Um, now, I could do one shot, which means I just touch it and the sound cue plays. As opposed to when I take one shot off, I have to hold it. The second I take my finger off, it stops. Um, or I could play it in reverse and I could take it off pitch. That's a cool sound design. Um, so for me, just basic playback, not on pitch. It's going to be a one shot. So I just want to touch it and go on. And uh, I do not want it to reverse. Then at the end of this, I'm going to come here and I have to save this instrument. So I'm going to save as. And I'm going to come in here and I've actually already saved it, but it's the shopbell.exs, which is your, now your instrument within the EXS24. I'm going to save that. Yeah, I'm going to just replace it. And a little trick that I do is these um, patches right now are still velocity sensitive. So I played it pretty softly. I'm going to hit it really hard. It changes the volume. But a lot of times when I'm playing a show and we want to just set a level for a sound cue, I don't want to deal with velocity. So I come in here and I change my velocity level all the way up to full. Great. So now my instrument is saved. Then what I'm going to do is decide, okay, what note am I going to put this on? Okay. So for me, for right now, a lot of times I put it down on that bottom A and bottom B flat, but since I've made your programming B patch advance, I'm going to do it a little higher. So I'm going to come here to layer editor. I'm going to call this shop bell. And I'm going to come here to layer editor and I'm going to low key, put that all the way down on that D zero and the high key D zero. So now what I have, as you can see here on my board, I have a singular go button. Okay. It's just there, singular go button. Um, and then just to show you how I would use this in this song, I would come in here, put in my alias, make sure now, you want to make sure that your instrument is not playing on top of the sound cue unless you do want it to. It's all about the programming. And um, I would say probably the shop bell is a little loud. So let's take it down negative six decibels. Okay, check this out. <laughs> So now all of a sudden that's all mapped out. This is a scenario where in, it depends on your budget, depends on what's going on. In the fun home that I did, we just decided all the sound cues would come from my board. In a commercial show or any sort of actual production of this show, um, that is definitely a visual sound cue and that should actually just come from the sound designer from the sound booth. But it's good to know how these things work. Um, good, so I talked about editing the channel strips, creating the go buttons. Uh, then I can come in here and we talked about sound routing. I can come in here and say, we're gonna send this sound cue um, specifically over to channels three and four, okay? Or let's say I've got this stereo track. This was something from last week uh, with outputs three and four. It's not working. So what I can do is pan it hard left, for example, and take my sound cue and I'm gonna pan it hard left. If I pan it hard left, it's gonna go only through the left channel, which is channel three. If I pan it hard right, it's only gonna go through the right channel, which is channel four. So there's some cheats and workarounds. Um, Georgia, I am at 157. <laughs> How would you like for me to proceed? Hi. Um, well, I just sent you a little message giving you a five minute warning. I think we uh, probably should 
like in two minutes do our official wrap up and let people go who we're planning just to be here from one to two. Mm -hmm. um, I'll go ahead and do that now and say thank you for joining us. And, and Julian, do you want to just answer some questions now? Are you ready to go into questions or do you have, what, what more do you have planned? Um, you know, um, I can, I'd say if anybody has some questions, I can answer them. I can also just kind of like quickly go into the next part. Um, it's pretty quick. So it's kind of what people want to do. Okay, here's the, I'm gonna let you go as you need to go. This is the official, thank you for joining us. You can log off if you need to. I'm gonna really try to wrap the whole thing up by 2.30, including questions and everything, just so that we, so people know what they're in for. But go, I don't wanna shut you down if you've got a lot more still to do. Awesome, thank you so much for anybody who has to leave. I really appreciate you spending some time with me. Um, and hopefully this like entire PDF document can help you out. Um, so that's kind of sound cue. Um, then I just wanted to circle back to audio setup and audio output. Can I interject for one second? For those who do have to leave, um, do they know how to reach out to you if they have a question that went unasked or unanswered? Ah, yes. Down here at the very, very bottom of your page. For more info, check me out, julianmerrill.com. Send me an email. Um, all of my contact info is on there, and that link is live clickable. Cool, and I am open to uh, questions, consulting, etc. Okay, so audio setup and audio output. I am circling back around to this chart um, from before. I just want to show you a couple. I wanted to clear up a couple things. A DI box versus a digital interface. Okay, so a DI box is a direct, um, a direct input. It converts unbalanced audio to balanced audio. Okay, so you're taking unbalanced audio out of your digital interface, which is that quarter inch, um, just tip sleeve instrument cable. You plug it into the DI box, which is your direct input. And then that's going to convert it to like XLR balanced output that can travel 100 feet because your instrument cable can only travel like 15 feet. Um, so I just wanted to kind of remind ourselves like that. Also, let's just talk about the digital interface and what the digital signal is. The digital interface is a converter box that takes the input of your analog signal and it converts it, the digital signal, to your computer, which is reading MIDI. The MIDI in the computer can also send through a digital signal to the digital interface and it can convert it output into analog signal. So it's kind of a two way, but your MIDI signal is from your keyboard and your pedals into your computer. The computer is sending con um, the, MIDI, the MIDI stuff, digital signals into and back and forth from the digital interface. The digital interface is converting analog signal. So you've got kind of these three things. Um, also, for those of you who are interested, this is what I gave Meg. <laughs> and she turned it into that. So that's pretty awesome. Um, so this is the really important part about the sound and the audio output of your rig. So you've got all this programming done. And um, I had a chat yesterday with like one of my favorite sound designers about exactly what he would love from your rig. So first of all, he's looking for a stereo output from one and two, okay? Stereo outputs from one and two. So if you've got your focus right, you've got your PreSonus, whatever your digital interface is. Um, we're looking for quarter inch unbalanced TS instrument cables, tip sleeve. You can use TRS tip ring sleeve, but not necessary. Um, and so I put those cables in the other packet. Uh, he's also looking for output level consistency. Um, your rig is the first starter block of, of his entire gain structure, okay? So we want all of my piano patches to be in that like zero, negative two, negative four space so that they live in the same space. Perhaps we want all of these sound cues to be at negative six, what's starting to feel right. Um, we want to mix any sort of layered instruments like we did on Tuesday with the Wurlitzer and the piano or the pads or like even the vibraphone with the piano. You want to mix your layered instruments to taste by ear, leaving at least six decibels of headroom. So what this means is on these channel strips, you come in here and you'll see zero is actually six decibels below the absolute top. So you see how I go all the way up to six? 
and I come back down here to zero. So we want to leave six decibels of headroom. That means like when your piano starts, patch starts playing and your vibraphone start, patch starts playing and you've got that little bit of pad, all of your, your gain levels are just inching their way up. So we want to have some places to be able to swell up above and then come underneath. So you want about six decibels of headroom. Um, the other things you're looking for are EQ level consistencies. All of your instruments should all sound live and like they are playing in the same room on the same frequencies. Okay, so if you're coming in and, and working on some of your EQ, like I've got this channel EQ here on this instrument, you know, I can play with some of these frequencies. Maybe I wanna take out some of the highs. Maybe I wanna boost some of the lows. Um, you know, that's starting to get more into sound design, but just keep it simple. Don't go crazy because you are just the first step in their game structuring. If, if the sound designer wants to add more EQ, they'll talk to you or they'll do it on their own on the board. Um, so that's just like basic. We just want things to be level and clean and have them all sounding like the same, they're in the same room. Um, a little bit more advanced, then they really love to get an auxiliary patch to put some basic reverb on it. Um, they would love like channels one and two, a dry stereo signal, and then channels three and four, just a basic wet reverb signal that then um, they can play with on their board and they can like control the reverb that you're sending. Um, so that's a great way to do that. In your program, in your template, I have given you a basic reverb patch. It's up here on the global level. It is called auxiliary one and it is silver verb. It's just basic dry versus wet. Um, I have saved it as the Julianne patch. So I at least know that this is like the reverb settings that I like. Um, you can change all of your room settings um, and you can, you can edit it from there. The way that things are patched through is, um, we, we call it busing. So digitally we bus our, our volume. Oh, my, I, I think I may have frozen. There we go, I'm back. Uh, digitally, we bus our volume out of the channel strip into an auxiliary and we send a certain volume level into that auxiliary, which is then going through reverb to either your main channels or outputs three and four. So um, what I did here is to add um, something. Let's do it on a patch that I don't have yet. So here's my impossible dream patch. I'm going to come to send. I'm going to say I'm going to bus it all the way up to bus number one, which is that reverb on aux one, which I gave you in your template. And just in general, like my sound friend, um, he wants it at ne just, just give him negative six. So he's got about 12 decibels of headroom. So I just take this and I drag it up to negative six. So now I know that um, I'm sending that amount of volume to the, to the um, auxiliary patch in my overall programming, which is right here. I can send my auxiliary, for example, to outputs three and four if I want to give sound um, a separate wet signal versus a dry signal. So there's outputs one and two and outputs three and four, and then I can control the, the volume levels. Um, great. If not enough sends, then send it through outputs one and two and work for sound with right levels within programming. Map your sound cues, for example, to output three and click to output four. And then we talked about the panning hard left to pan hard right. Um, so that's basically just basic sound, giving the sound um, designer what they need. And then my very final thing, I'm actually not going to go through it here, but um, Zena asked me to put together an instrument library. Uh, these instruments are called VSTs. They are virtual studio technology. So this is now like phew, the world's your oyster. There are so many boutique patch makers. There's free patches. You can buy very expensive instrument patches. I mean, some people I trust, some people I'm like, nah, that does not sound good. So it's, it's personal preference. But you're looking for VSTs that can be loaded in. Some really popular ones I put on here, East West Sounds. I have their um, massive libraries. They do um, a lot of like film scoring. So uh, Xena, they've got strings, they've got the brass, they have the ethnic percussion, and they have like these big bundles. They have the pianos, they have 
the woodwinds, they have like the solo cello, they have the gypsy violin. It just depends on how much money you want to spend. If you, if you all remember my, um, my race car metaphor, I mean, you know, you can throw some flame stripes on there and racing stripes and I mean, buff up, give yourself a double muffler like the world's your oyster. Um, native instruments are super popular. These include the instruments contact, battery, reactor, guitar rig, absinthe, FM8, massive, the Giant is a really popular um, piano. I think a lot of you have na native instruments. You can certainly load them in. Um, if I were to load in a native instrument, I would come down here and add a channel patch. I would come over here and add my channel strip, software instrument. And I would come down here to instrument and go all the way down to AU instruments, which I believe is audio unit instruments, and I'm going to come over here to my native instruments, and then I'm going to pick, you know, if I'm doing absinthe, which is like serious synthetic modulation, pick a stereo track. Um, I haven't used these in a little while, but now look, now I've got the absinthe instrument, and now I have all of my native instruments here to play with and save into my programming. Um, so that's how that works. Uh, Sunday sounds, if you're on a worship team, lots and lots of pads and scents. They have those ones like, oh, you know, sign up for an email blast and we'll give you 150 free patches. You know, there's a lot of things like that. Um, I gave you some blogs, visit sites like Sweetwater, see what kind of deals they have. Also, a lot of software companies let you download trials. Sometimes like this cluster of notes don't work or you can't save or like you can't do velocity mapping, things like that. Um, the Arturia Prophet 5 emulator is really awesome if you're looking for a lot of synth patches and, and, and emulating that like classic Prophet 5. Also, the cool thing about it is you can change the oscillators, you can um, change the wave. Um, I've also done a ton of research on virtual pianos, um, so I put all of that over there. Uh, I believe that the Broadway standard has been the Synthogy Ivory 2. I will tell you it needs 77 gigs minimum to run. <laughs> it's a lot. And it also takes an iLock, which is a whole nother level of like encryption and protection. Um, Alicia's Keys, pretty good. Garreton Abbey Road Studios, they came in and they sampled a um, Yamaha's nine foot CFX concert grand that they have over Abbey Road in London. Um, it is 133 gigs um, and it also takes eight gigs of RAM to run. It does sound pretty awesome. It is sampled like every velocity level, microphone levels, check it out. Uh, the Modart Piano Tech is really cool because it is a model. It's, it's now, instead of sampling, it's using modeling. It's basically like doing architecture inside of software to recreate how the sound bounces around within the wood. And they fully modeled a Steinway D and a Steinway B. Um, it's extremely compact. Like, I think it's like five megabytes. It's so tiny. Um, the Ravenscroft 275, that's actually what I ended up buying. It's kind of a mid-grade piano six gigs, uh, addictive keys, keyscape, etc. cetera. Um, so please, I'm hoping also in the comments that um, I, as a main stage collective, please go ahead and um, survey the crowd, like put in your recommendations. I'd love to hear like what kind of rigs you're operating, what kind of sounds you love. And then everybody, you know, save that chat, take a look at it. This is like an awesome collective for um, synth nerds. And uh, yeah, this is the end of my presentation. Thank you for joining me, and I hope that you all feel, you're probably very overwhelmed, but I hope that you all feel like you are empowered enough to like program a basic show. Um, if you want to like practice and do some work later on, I gave you this song, What's Up, Duloc? <laughs> um, just check it out, fast strings, you've got a heart gliss, you've got a piano that's actually an octave layer. So instead of playing both hands, work harder, smart, work harder, not smarter, put two piano layers on and transpose one of them down an octave and play one hand. There's ways to like work around these. Uh, violin section plus oboe. Uh, you have a preset one touch harp uh, B7 gliss. And then patch change, tremolo strings, and then another harp gliss on the bottom. So this would be like a really fun programming exercise if you want to do that. Um, and then let's do some questions. I'm ready. I'm going to open it up for questions, Jamie. Great. So we have a long list of technical questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming we will not get through all of these questions. So I'm going to say, again, I'm going to remind people, if we don't get to your question, Julianne, 
has graciously given you her contact info and is open to you reaching out to her. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just gonna start. Um, the first question we have is, if we are pretty ignorant about sound as far as terminology and setup, what is a good resource to get some basic info? This PDF. Absolutely. This PDF, like just knowing like output and like just just looking at this signal flow um, is already hopefully going to prepare you for that. Um, I mean, also Google is your friend, just like a sound glossary is easy to find, but I tried to incorporate a lot of sound, like basic sound terminology into these past two PDFs. And then um, the next question we have is, uh, can you quickly, I don't know if this is doable quickly, but can you quickly cover making triggers like gliss, arpeggio runs, et cetera? As another class. Great. It's sorry, it, it's possible, but it's just a whole nother rabbit hole. How do you create layered patches with aliases from the master instrument set? Yeah. So if I come over here, I click add. So I've just got a new patch. Um, let's say we did this. We're going to take Steinway grand, grand Piano. We're going to Command C. Come up here to Untitled Patch. Just click in the gray area, Option Command V. You've now got one layer. Um, and then you're coming come down here to the Whirly, for example. You're going to Command C. Come up here to the Steinway Grand. You're going to Option Command V. And now you have a layered patch. And then you can go in and and you see, I already set these aux settings to your reverb. I like, you know, we talked about on Tuesday, um, you know, maybe I'll take this whirly down negative six decibels so that the piano is a little more present. Okay. I think the asker who, who asked that question said that when they tried it with the copy paste from the master instrument set, it kept creating a new patch instead of a new layer. Uh, that's because they're copying into the patch over here like this. Oh no, wait, stop. So if I copy this, control, command C, and I come over here and I command V, I, I think that there may be a problem. They may be copying like the master patch, I'm not totally sure, uh, versus coming into the channel strips. So like you gotta copy channel strips to channel strips, or you can copy, I don't recommend this, but you like once you say you have like an entire patch saved, and you want to use it later, then you can copy the entire patch, control V, and then now you've got two patches. Great. And then um, we had somebody asking for advice when um, you are not technically the person who was in charge of the programming, but you're the one driving it. Um, and if you have to do troubleshooting, if you have advice for that. Um, you know, I, that is a conversation Again, in, in, in coming into tech, et cetera, establish that relationship with your programmer and have the pro, I, again, I am a, I need to understand how it works and how everything functions before I am like, it's difficult for me to just jump in and say, oh, I press this button, okay, like, and I don't know what it means. So I just will have a conversation ahead of time with the programmer and say, Please explain to me, and then, what if scenarios? What if this computer crashes? Hopefully, on a larger budget show, you have a redundant rig. Uh, what if, you know, how do I fix this? Um, how do I troubleshoot? So, like, um, go ahead and create those communication dialogues with your programmer in advance, hopefully. Or if, you know, you jump into something, then message your programmer. Because again, it's kind of like a respect thing and chain of command. You don't want to mess anything up any further. Um, and then can you explain with the floating down note feature, um, apparently some music directors are saying to not use that. And we had somebody ask, why not? I don't know what we mean by the floating down note feature. Um. I would have to defer to the person who asked that question. Yeah. Was that Hosun or who, who asked that? Let me just scroll back a tiny bit. Uh, yes, that was Hosun. Okay. I'm sorry, I just don't quite know what you mean by the floating down note. Hosun, if you want, you can speak up and explain what you meant by that question. 
Yeah, it's um, just a floating notes so using the floating function in layer. Uh-huh. That, oh, uh, oh, down here? Yeah. Okay, so what do I do? Uh, what I did is I set the lowest note for the vibe. Yeah. Then I had like two more notes floating. So that way I have a motion, the moving motion, like in the, at the end, in the bottom of the page, when I have moving notes downwards, it, the vibe floats down up to that note. Uh huh. So that way I don't have to create a new patch. Yeah, that's cool. Didn't know that. So I can come here and I could say, I can go down two notes. Yeah. Like this, what, uh, do I do negative two? No. Uh, Okay, yeah. so it depends on which direction you want to. So you, you add two more notes and then you'll have little shady notes showing up and that will only show you when you are in that direction. So in other words, it's a floating oh. up, that means when you're in the ascending scale, that will float, that will expand that range of the note. Cool, that is new to me, did not know that. <laughs> So, yeah, but then I had some music directors that just don't just use use that. So I never heard the explanation, and I thought that was very useful to use it. Otherwise, I have to create the new patch because it, they clash the range. Correct. I've always had to do that. I would love to um, explore that further. I don't know anything about it, but I appreciate you bringing that up, and that's something I'm going to look into. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, a question that we've had kind of twice is, um, once you've assigned and labeled all your patch numbers and they're in a sequential order, what happens if you have to delete or insert a patch? Is there a way that you can make it so that you don't get everything all messed up? Yeah, that's when you can start using point cues. Okay, so now let's say, for example, uh, or backwards. So for example, host son is like, look, uh, you're going to use this floating patch. And so we now have no need to get to play, to have this vibraphone patch change. I'm just gonna delete it, and I'm gonna take that sticker out of the book, and 65 just no longer exists, in a, in a sense. Or if you're like super, like for, for, for a high level programming, then I would go through and I would change every number. Um, I don't quite know if there's another way to do it, but let's say uh, between 66 and 67, oh, I have to add a vibraphone patch, then, um, or like, oh, I have this vibraphone patch wrong, perhaps, I don't, um, or no, I would come down here and add it. So I might go control C, and I might come here, control V, and stick it in there, and I'm going to call this 66.1. Oops, what did I do? So this is like, that's basic um, sound and light cue programming, is you start adding point cues. So then you can still keep all of your other cues and then I can just stick a um, sticker in that says 66.1. That's at least what I would do. Great. Um, next question, sustain pedal issue. Sometimes it sustains and sometimes it switches to the new sound. Is there a rule for this? Um, this is probably gonna come back to your sustain pedal mapping. Um, if you can come, if you're in like your edit workspace, if you click on your sustain pedal, I'm going to go all the way up to the top to our global editing and click on your sustain pedal and click on assignments and mapping. Um, channel two, 64 sustain. I'm going to come down here to my mapping. Um, I'm going to click send to all keyboard one, um, which is going to be same as input. Oh, here it is, the keyboard one destinations, and I'm going to physically assign it to the general MIDI control change number 64, which, which is sustain. And then you might also go back to your layout editing and see if this little um, patch advanced pedal is also on 64. Um, there, sometimes it might have some issues of like, wait, am I sustaining or am I patch advancing? So it's really good to go into your edit workspace mappings and um, really make sure that your sustain pedal, uh, where'd it go? This one, this sustain is going to 64, whereas you'll see up here, this channel two is also on sustain, but I've labeled it as patch advance and I've come in here to actions and put it on to next patch, which is down here, actions next patch. It's just troubleshooting, but that's, that's kind of the mappings that I would do. 
Great. Next question. Um, when you are copying sounds with multiple strips, do you need to highlight all of the channel strips when you're copying? Um, so if you're copying, are you copying an entire patch? Like, uh, you know, like this Vibes Piano Curse patch is the same later on. Are you going to copy the entire patch? If that's the case, I'm just going to actually control C the entire patch and drop it in here and retitle it. Um, or if you're just trying to take, like, I just want to take vibraphone and Steinway piano, um, like, um, this, right? Like, these are both aliased, then yeah, click on it and then, um, shift click to select both and then command C. And then, um, I can create a new patch, come in here, option command V, and they're both in there. And then I could add another layer on top. Cool. Oh, hope that helps. Um, okay. I'm not 100% sure what this question means. Mm -hmm. but when you suggest assigning volume to the expression pedal rather than volume, do you mean the MCC number, assuming that we only have one expression pedal, not multiple pedals? Correct. So, um, so a lot of times when you assign your expression pedal, this is technical because the physical gear that we use is technically called an expression pedal as opposed to a volume pedal. And the thing you just have to understand is that expression and volume are different. Expression is a percentage of your volume um, as opposed to, so I'll show you like in here on your channel strip. So expression is in MIDI is zero to 127. And that's um, also comes in on your velocity so up here, I have these green uh, wheels. So this is expression. So a lot of times, if an expression pedal is mapped, let me just map it up here. Do, 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 global. No, no, no. There we go. I'm going to come over here to mappings. And originally, it was mapped. Oh, gosh. I'm having difficulty kind of, there it is. No, I'm having difficulty doing this on the fly actually. But um, originally I had it mapped to expression, which means that when you, did, when you did this on the pedal, it would just change the velocity of the patches as opposed, but the overall volume would stay the same. So expression is MIDI control change number 11, volume is number seven. So then in my um, programming, I come in here, and this is what I did in your template, is that I mapped your expression pedal to actually control volume as opposed to um, expression, just so that then you're actually controlling volume levels instead of velocity levels. I hope that makes sense. Um, this one's a quick one. Can you assign an expression pedal to pitch bend in the absence of a wheel? I believe so, yes. Uh, that would take me some time to think about and like do some research on, but I believe any sort of a, uh, uh, cause this is what's called like an absolute volume. So any sort of mapping like this, you can come down here and, um, and come over here. So I'm going to do, uh, you know, if I'm going to, I believe that it's possible that is some like, super geeky stuff that I would have to do some research on, but I believe any of this stuff to an extent is possible because then you can start using graphs like this to then show um, as you depress the pedal, we're going to go like this, or we're going to go like this, etc. And then everything is customizable inside of that. Um, but I do believe to an extent it can happen. I think I've tried it once and then my brain melted. And then um, is it, it is possible to run sample libraries from an external hard drive? We had yes. some confusion about uh -huh. that. Yes, yeah, so, um, so like for my East West symphonies, I have this terabyte hard drive um, that I plug into my computer and it is solely dedicated to the storage of my instruments. And so um, I keep my play libraries on there and then 
um, I send it all, especially when I'm programming, um, I pull all the all of the sounds from there. However, for an actual performance, um, when I go to save, save as, I like to bundle all of those sounds and kind of like make a print copy of those sounds. Um, and I like to bundle them uh, into a concert. So I copy, for example, my EXS instruments, ultra beat samples, playback loopback samples, Alchemy, um, also copy Apple Sound Library content. Um, it's been a little while since I've programmed with some of this stuff um, because it's such heavy CPU usage, but there are ways to uh, record it and print it. And I think you kind of maybe even load it into the, your EXS sampler and then save that as an instrument so that then for actual live performance, you're not dragging on that giant hard drive, but it is possible to play from a hard drive. Great. And then um, we had so, um, two people ask, so a lot of these things where you have to actually purchase things to trick out your main stage. If you're doing a pro show, how much of these setup and things like this is the responsibility of, of the music director versus the company to get your main stage all set up like that? If you are doing a pro show, you are hiring a programmer and your job is to just like have some consulting conversations about how queuing things work and how like playability works, but like they're going to come in with the programming for you. And then, you know, I could say, mm, I don't like that sound and have a conversation about it. But other than that, I don't, I don't believe that I'm expected to come up with this. So this kind of stuff for me as an MD is coming from like a one person music team with no budget, et cetera. But like the show would be financially responsible for paying for what you have to bring into the program. Um, you know, I would, I would think like I've done a show before where uh, I did Hunchback of Notre Dame and I was like, I really need to buy this awesome hammered dulcimer patch, you know, and I found it and it was 50 bucks and they, the theater reimbursed me for that. I submitted an invoice for that. Um, a lot of programmers come with their own sound libraries. You're going to pay for that level of programming for sure. So at some point, the theater is probably paying for the level of programming and sounds. But I have, I've done that. Like, hey, I really got to buy this singular patch. It's $30. It's $50. Can you please cover this? And I just, I just um, submit the receipts. All right. Um, last question. Uh, we had somebody ask if you can just explain what you mean by redundant rig. Ah, yes, so a redundant rig. So again, we're talking about budgets and commercial and, and getting larger and larger. Um, so <laughs> your entire show is operating on this computer. <laughs> and you're, you know, you're running your clicks and like, then you're sending all this timestamp to sound and lights and blah, 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 blah. And your computer goes, see ya, or whatever, like it gets stuck. It is the most dreadful, horrific feeling in the world. Uh, it can bring your entire show to a complete total halt. So what we do, it's just an insurance policy. We do redundant rigs. You're going to get a little A, B stomp box on the floor. Your A computer is a main stage computer that is running all of your keyboard programming. Your B computer is just a copy, another singularly dedicated computer that is daisy chained to your previous computer that is running the exact or daisy chained also, I don't, you know, all of the specifics, my sound people could explain it better, but it's running all of the cues as well. Its output is just muted. When you click on that, if you have a, a panic attack, uh, which I've had, and your keyboard, the computer just freezes and your sound is stuck, you step on that stop box to computer B and that computer B is like, here I am. <laughs> So that is, that's what's called a redundant rig and it's an A-B stomp box and it's used in all, I would assume, commercial productions. Same thing, you're going to have a redundant rig if you're running Ableton, et cetera. Great. All right. So we are going to wrap it up here. I know there are some questions we didn't get to, but we're yeah. going to, yeah, we're going to end it here. And if you had a question that was not answered, again, Julianne is open to you reaching out to her with those questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I hope everybody is at least able to walk away today being slightly less terrified of this program. And I hope that it is becoming more and more user friendly because, you know, for $29, like, you, it's a very powerful program. And I just hope that you're able to implement it and 
feel free to reach out. And also just, these are my opinions. Um, I'm a, I'm a music director, not a professional designer, but it's, this is my little hobby that I'm showing you what I do. And it's wonderful. Thank you, Julianne. And thank you everyone for being with us today. Uh, we will see you hopefully again next week. We just added classes all the way through July with a few more to come. So take cool. a look at the menu and see what else uh, uh, makes you interested and want to participate. Um, thanks for being here. Thank you, Julianne. Thanks everybody. I really appreciate it. And thank you, Maestra. Donate, donate.